Are you? Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Huddle, Director of Events and Marketing at Politics and Prose. Thank you all for joining us here for PNP Live with Colin McCann and Ben Rhodes. We feel so lucky to be able to continue to bring you the authors you love to the politics and prose community. At any time during the event, you can click on the green button at the bottom of your screen below to purchase a Paragon on PNP's website. I don't feel like I need to tell you how crucial your support is right now. Another way to support our programming tonight is by using the donate button at the bottom of your screens and contributing whatever you are able to, to make sure we can keep bringing you all of this content. You can ask Colm or Ben a question by clicking on ask a question, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. Please put any questions there instead of in the chat bar. You can also read other people's questions and even vote for ones you'd like to hear answered the most. Tonight, if you have any issues with Crowdcast, make sure you're using Chrome or Firefox. And, and the most basic thing is just try refreshing your browser. It often just really helps. If for some reason we have a platform issue, um, we might stick a link in the chat bar and we'll go over to YouTube Live, um, but I don't forecast that happening. Tonight is a special night as well because it marks the inaugural event in a new series, Dublin Voices, which grew out of a very organic and passionate collaboration between Politics and Prose, Solus Nua, the Global Irish Studies Initiative at Georgetown University and the Embassy of Ireland. I'd like to thank all of our partners with a special thanks to Dennis Houlihan and Ambassador Mulhall and the Embassy of Ireland. In the coming months, we are highlighting the diverse narratives and multiple realities that spring from the Irish capital, continuing with Sinead Gleeson in conversation with Leslie Jameson next Sunday, June 7th at 3 p.m. Colm is an interesting author to begin this series because while much of his award-winning body of work, including Transatlantic, has overtly Irish themes, his latest novel, A Paragon, looks far beyond Dublin to the story of a Palestinian and Israeli man, both who face unbearable loss. But in a certain and sad way, the racial and cultural conflicts he interrogates are universal. And I can't think of a more poignant work to be discussing tonight as we confront the injustices that persist within our own borders. Colm is joined by Ben Rhodes, a writer, commentator, and podcaster, who's written a crucial book of his own about his experiences working within the Obama administration, the world as it is. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Colm McCann and Ben Rhodes to PNP Live. Great, well, thanks so much. Um, I'm very honored to be here uh, with my good friend, Colm McCann, who I think is as good a storyteller and writer as, as, as we have today. And so we're, Colin, we're fortunate for your, your body of work. Um, and we're, we're fortunate that you took the, the time and the effort and, and really you can tell by reading uh, this book, uh, it felt like reading the sum total of everyone's, uh, of, of your knowledge and experience uh, channeled into this creative form that, that you, uh, you arrived at. I guess I just wanted to start. I mean, the book obviously has such a powerful premise. Um, you know, the, an Israeli father, a Palestinian father, um, uh, real people who'd lost their daughters uh, in tragic circumstances related to the conflict, uh, and had struck up this uh, this relationship, this friendship, uh, informed by their shared experience. And I just wanted to ask you, what, when did you first hear the stories of of Ronnie, the Israeli, and Bassam, uh, the Palestinian? fathers, um, how did you hear their stories and, and did you immediately have a thought, you know, this is something I, I want to write about? Um, can I just um, pre, pre, just, just just jump in and say um, thank you to, to, to Liz and thank you to you, ma'am, for, 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 for doing this. We should tell everybody uh, that we know each other. Um, yeah. We've known each other for, 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 for a few years. Um, we got to know each other um, during the Obama administration, and um, we had a couple of encounters with a um, maybe a bottle of whiskey along the way somewhere, yeah. and Cody Keenan and and people like that. But I also have to tell everybody who's online that 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 that, that you are now looking at the face, not this face, that face um, of one of two people who I ever met um, before uh, I published this book. Who knew what the word a paragon uh, meant? It was so cool. I was like, you blew my mind. We were we were walking in Central Park. Well, you tell the story. Well, yeah, no, we were. Uh, so I should say, yeah, Colin and I got uh, struck up a great friendship along with Cody Keenan, 
who is President Obama's chief speech writer, thanks in part, by the way, to the Irish Embassy, which is one of our... Exactly right. We may have had some of that whiskey um, at the premises of the Irish ambassador's residence. Um, our shared love of, of all things uh, Irish and literary brought us together. But yeah, I remember we were in Central Park and um, uh, we're taking a long walk. My, my parents actually live across the street from Colm and so it made it easy for us to get together. And you were describing uh, this this journey you'd set out on to do this book, and 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 we were talking a bit about, you know, the complexity of taking on this issue because you know, uh, there's no way to wade into it um, that's not going to, you know, uh, evoke some type of response uh, from any number of quarters. But then I remember when you mentioned this uh, paragon to me, you know, I I the reason I knew it. When you, I was a speechwriter, you know, for for ten years for President a Obama. Great speechwriter. Well, I got you know what you look good when you write for Obama, and um, but the um, you're always collecting words. Um, I was always collecting words because one of the jobs of a speechwriter, I mean, like any writer, but especially a speechwriter, when you're you know President of the United States gives thousands of remarks over eight years. You're often saying the same thing in different ways. You're looking for new terminology, new words. Uh, and actually, we didn't use a paragon because it's a little too complicated and, and it doesn't roll off the tongue. But actually, it's a very Obama concept, you know, um, that there are, you know, right. kind of an infinite but countable number of sides to an issue, right? Um, Obama was someone who was always trying to look right. at the multi dimensional nature of issues and can we look at things from, this perspective or from within this person's shoes. So I had at some point, probably just like you were struck by the word, thought, well, what an interesting concept. Uh, but I never really did get to use it. I'm glad you put it to use for this for this book. And that. See, the, 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 the thing was, I, I'm the exact same. I tucked it in the back of my mind because um, I was writing about Senator George Mitchell. I was writing about the Northern Irish peace process. And I was thinking polygonal, you know, you know, you know, hectic. Gone, they could go. and, and, and I came upon this word, a paragon, and I was like, wow, that's kind of wild, but I can't use it in this book because I don't think anybody's going to know what it actually is. Uh, let me just tuck it back here. Um, yeah. And then, you know, when it came to, 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 to this, and, 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 and you, you know, uh, you, know you spent so much time in, um, working on, on, on stuff in the Middle East, it's going to be, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to, 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 yeah. to unpack um, all of that with you. But, um, the, the the minute I sort of came upon um, you know the, the 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 novel as it was going to be or the book as it was going to be, uh, the title just like rang out in my head. And you should have seen the face of my publishers. They were like, "You're going to call it what? You're going to write about like Israel Palestine, and then you're going to call it a paragon." Um, but you know they supported me, and my friends supported me uh, very much with it. But to get to your original question, um, I went to Israel and Palestine uh, with Narrative 4, which is my story exchange uh, organization that I co-founded with Lisa Consiglio, who's probably on, uh, you know, here this evening listening in, um, along with others who were, who, who were there, Don Duncan and others. But um, we went across and I had my heart blown open. Uh, I went to Beit Jala. I went into this little room. There's the second to last day of this trip. I was confused. And these two men were sitting there, Rami and Bassam, and they told me the stories about how they had lost their daughters. One is Israeli, one is Palestinian, and how they were using the force of their grief, uh, actually weaponizing the force of their grief in order to, um, to cleave open the hearts, the heads, the ears of, of, of people all around them to say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if we don't know each other above ground, uh, we're going to be in trouble because we'll end up knowing each other six feet uh, below ground. And, um, you know, I came back and I couldn't get these guys um, out of my head. I still can't get them out of my head. I'll never get them out of my head. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of so wedded to them. Um, and they've become amongst my best friends. Um, and I think they're extraordinary human beings. I think they, they for me, they operate on, on a level with Aaron Duttai Roy and John Hume, even... I mean, I'm Gandhi and people like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding that I think that these men have the strength in the face of all available evidence. And you know the available evidence, Ben. I mean, you've seen it uh, and you know the difficulties that, that, yeah. that people go through over there. For them to stand up 
with the force of their principles and the way they, that, that, that they do is kind of extraordinarily uh, gracious and brave. Well, you know, so then you, if you have this basic concept that you're going to, you know, tell their stories, but you're also going to say something kind of essential about this this conflict that they're caught trapped within, and, and we'll unpack pieces of that. Um, but it, but it, it strikes me that, you know, you're attacking a, and you've written before about kind of current or historical events, 9-11, Northern Ireland peace process among them. But here's an issue where it feels like it can, it must feel like everything's been said that could be said. And, and certainly, you know, it almost feels like from a nonfiction standpoint, there's nothing left to say. There's, you know, uh, but, but did you feel like you could explore the multi-dimensional nature of this, the paragon nature of this conflict through fiction in a way that, that, you know, nonfiction and journalism is almost insufficient? I mean, how did you think about melding together the real stories of these two men with, you know, the, the fictional world that you could create to, to try to say something new about, about something that people are so familiar with. Yeah, you know, I hate when artists say this and I hate when writers say it, but, 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 but a lot of the time I didn't know what I was doing, man. I mean, <laughs> seriously, I was, I, I, I was operating on a wing and a prayer. I knew that I wanted to disrupt people. I knew that I wanted to disrupt the conventional monolithic idea of what is a Palestinian, monolithic idea of what is an Israeli. I knew after being there that these people were so much more nuanced than they were allowed to be. The situation was confusing. I wanted to talk about being confused. I wanted to embrace the idea of being confused. I didn't want it to be, you know, me to give a, 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 an historical lesson. And for years, I've been wanting my, my, my students to write a book that sort of like apes the, the, the mind on the internet. Um, and uh, eventually everything came together for me. And, 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 um, and while I say I don't like writers saying that, 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 that they, they just sort of took off. And for me, I don't know, you, you've seen me uh, like singing late at night. You know I can't sing, right? But, 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 but there was something deeply musical about this piece that I was like this weird conductor. And honestly, it felt like there was like 200 instruments out there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I was trying to get them all to play together and, 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 and to tell a story, to tell a symphony, but also not to get too political and also to acknowledge my own confusion and all of these different things um, that, that were going on. It was a four and a half, five year process. Um, and I'm glad I stuck with it, but sometimes it was really, really, really tough. And now it seems, okay, yeah, yeah, I have this book and it's together and it's a thousand and one sections and it goes and it has a symmetry. But Jesus, man, when I was in the midst of it, I, mean, I had sometimes no, but you know, you write fiction. Yeah. You know, you sometimes you just, you're, 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 you're pulling from deep, deep down, like, and, and, and you don't know what's going to happen. Well, I, I was curious, you know, so the, and people, if you haven't checked this book out, I mean, I, I cannot recommend it enough. It's for so many different reasons. It's beautiful to read. It's, it's got uh, passages that you have to stop and read again because they're just so powerful. It will change the way you think, I think, not just about this conflict, but about any number of things. And, and, and I wanted to look, you know, you, you mentioned you have a thousand and one sections. Uh, I want to unpack a couple pieces of this. W one thing is you mentioned kind of mimicking the internet, but there's a tremendous amount of just information in this book. I um, mean, you know, I found myself learning everything from like, you know, the migratory patterns of birds over Israel and Palestine to the number of gallons in a swimming pool to the size of the core of the plutonium uh, of the Nagasaki bomb. I could go on. And by the way, you know, uh, rich information, but all felt, connected to what you said, like this kind of symphony that, that there are themes that you are illuminating. But I'm wondering, how do you select, you know, what to include, what tangents to go on, what detail to include? I mean, how do you go about not just building this, this structure that you build, the innovative structure of a thousand one sections that have symmetry to them, but, but, but what is it about a piece of information that sticks in your head and finds its way into a, a narrative like this? It's really interesting to me. I mean, um, so 
Uh, I met Rami and Bassam. I came back. I tried to write a novel uh, that had a Northern Irish character in it because I thought, you know, I'm really scared and we should talk maybe a little bit about cultural appropriation and why the hell should an Irish person go in there. But I was really scared. And so I, I was doing it from an Irish point of view. And guess what? I just didn't like that book. And 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 um, I decided, okay, I'm going um, I was actually talking with 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 um, the co-founder of Narrative Four, Lisa Consiglio, and and I said I'm giving up that book, and and she said, well, why? And I said, well, because I just don't have my heart in it. And she said, well, what what was it about? Um, what was it about the trip to Israel that 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 you know you know really sort of like um, brought you in? I said, well, Rami and Bassam across, and she said, why don't you write about Rami and Bassam? And I'm like, oh my God. I mean that's really scary. Um, you know, uh, am I going to uh, uh, am I going to be able to do this? So I come, I started to think about um, you know meeting them, and I meet them in a town called Bejala, and so I Google Bejala, and in googling Bejala, I find this thing called a bird ringing center. You know, and I was yeah. like, what the hell is bird ringing? Um, and and then I feel, oh, it's beautiful. The patterns of birds is on a migratory superhighway. Um, and then I'm thinking, okay, then I went to Beit Jala uh, again, and I went to the um, the actual bird ringing center. And the morning I was there, man, the morning I was there, they found a songbird in, in, in one of the nets. And they had me hold this little songbird in, in, in the palm of my hand. And then I remember thinking, I read something about 5, 10, 20, 15 years ago, I can't remember what, about Mitron and his last meal was a, was, was a songbird. And so it was all like a collision of all these different things in my head. So that in certain ways, the book became an autobiography of my own encounter with the Middle East and Rami and Bassam. But, but, but much more than that, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the key to, to, to the book was allowing the reader to become uh the narrator so so there's a lot of people have a lot of different experiences uh with this book whether you know certain people are pro-israel pro-palestine -pro pro-peace whatever it happens to to be but it was um it was it was sort of that and and then you know then i remembered oh philippe petit and when i did, you know he did a tightrope walk in jerusalem and and and, and all of these things came and but everything kept coming back to the two girls and they, they're the most important characters i mean a beer and smadar and then yeah. in Basan. I so did you know the other thing I noticed in reading it, um, the this this the the way in which you render the story of their 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 deaths, their their killings, um, is some of the most um, uh, as a father, I mean, you you really put the reader into the position of being a father losing a child and the details that they remember. You know the candy that a beer uh, had wanted to buy. Um, it is so. It was so wrenching to experience their loss, kind of in the reliving of the moment of the suicide bombing that killed uh, the Israeli girl and the rubber bullet that killed the Palestinian. Sure. Girl. That that it, it 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 felt also like I am needed to get out of that. You know, and and, and then but then you're going to guide me through. What is a suicide bomb or what is a rubber bullet and then that's going to lead you in all kinds of other directions i mean did you and you write a lot about you know as we've talked about kind of world events like what is how do you balance the you know really nesting the reader in the kind of personal experience of your character versus them pulling back maybe almost giving them a break from that emotional experience and and then and then informing them about uh, a broader dynamic and in a way that they maybe hadn't thought about before i mean do, do you do you think about a certain balance that you're you're looking for between the kind of narrative of what it's like to be the parent in that situation and and the backdrop uh and the information that that informs it you know that that, that 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 that's such an important thing because it's going on in your head the, the the whole time. I think the best writing doesn't tell you uh, what to think, but the, the 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 best writing allows you to think. So you there as, as an author, and you're you, you, what you know. So much of it is gut feeling. You know, 
am I, you know, am I selling too much? Am I allowing? And, and what I kind of think um, is very important is that you want to exist in the pulse of the moment, right? You want your reader to be there and you want her to be there and, 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 and to, to, to experience this thing again, which is kind of why Rami and Bassam find it, found it hard to read the book. They were being incredibly gracious about the book, but it was difficult for them to read it because they had to experience it again because I pushed it so hard to like, like, like that you had to be there at the coal face um, of, of, of the moment. But if you're there at the coal face at the moment, it's so freaking intense that, that, that sometimes you just got to cut away. And so yeah. if I'd have written it like a, a traditional, you know, sort, sort, sort of book, it would never have worked. Yeah. Um, so it had to go in and I had to chop and then uh, and, and go cyber. But the story itself is incredible. I mean, if you just think about Bassam's story, he's, you know, he grows up Palestinian. He's 17 years old. He has polio. Um, they, they find grenades. Uh, they're dud grenades. They roll them in under an Israeli jeep. He spends seven years in uh, in an Israeli prison. While he's in prison, this is all true, he's commander of the Fatah unit, he sees a documentary about the Holocaust, it throws him completely for a loop, he gets out, he, uh, uh, he, he starts a group called Combatants for Peace, and then two years later, after, 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 this is mind-boggling, after starting Combatants for Peace, his daughter uh, gets killed. And the strength of this man to say, I am going to continue this peace work um, is, I mean, I'm not sure that we could invent it. I mean, I have a line in there and, and, and we think the myths are startling. Uh, yeah. And I, I repeat it a number of times and we think the myths are startling. Because guess what? Everyday life is sometimes so freaking startling that 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 it just it, it it sort of takes your breath away, and it's an interesting place for a fiction writer to be. Well, yeah, and, and isn't uh, you know Rami's father-in-law is a, is a, a from the peace camp in Israel too, so right. they're they're both on the uh, and just to give people a sense of these details, because I, I wanted to ask you about the kind of discovery of it. I mean, I, I, and I, I correct me, I think I have this right. I read this a, a few weeks ago, but the when. Um, when Smidar, he, he pulls out the drawer uh, after she's been killed, um, when Rami her, has to go through this, this moment that no parent should ever have to go through, he, I, I'll never forget the detail that this, this, this young Israeli girl had this giant grandparent in her life um, uh, who was a figure who, who believed deeply in peace and who died only recently before she was killed. And that she was wearing the watch uh, that he had given her, and it was still ticking. Um, I mean, how do you, did, is that something that, a detail you learn in talking to Rami, and, and when you hear something like that, it, to, to relate to what you're just saying, there's so many details like that, it it somehow was, you you couldn't invent it. I mean, here, you know, she has a grandfather who's uh, advocates for peace, a father who's had to fight in Israel's wars, she's killed by a suicide bomber, uh, the father picks her up and, and he notices the first thing is that she's still wearing the watch of her grandfather and it's ticking. I mean, there, you must have stumbled on, and you did in reading the book, so many details like that. Uh, how, how did they let you into their stories enough for you to discover that? Um, uh, and what was it like to, to feel? Did you, you must have felt a great responsibility um, in taking. I love, for, I love you for this question because you know, everything about what you, you've said. Uh, is true but uh, and a lot of people have asked me you know what's true and what's not true in the book and you know and and, and i i've sort of refused to say um you know uh, a lot of the time what 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 is true and what is not true but i'm going to reveal something here tonight for the first time it's not true about the watch it is true about everything else but the watch signifies everything that she felt for her, 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 her grandfather, her grandfather, um, and and it works as a symbol. Um, like, and I, you know, and when I sent the book to Rami, Rami was like, uh, you know, Rami is seventy years old. He dr drives a motorbike. He drives really fast, and and and, and it's all true. Whatever is happening in the book, but guess what? He drives an automatic. I didn't like the automatic. I wanted people to be on the bike, right? Yeah. 
So yeah. I put them on gears. And even just using the word like clicking into fifth gear, pulls the clutch, does these things, it puts the reader on the motorbike. So what the watch does, um, it puts the reader into the relationship between Smadar and her grandfather. I don't think that that is manipulative. I think it is illustrative. Um, but I think it's really important to walk a fine line between you know, what you want your reader to feel, which is the textural truth of all this stuff, mm. not just the factual truth. And you and I, know we're living in that, that era right now where, 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 where we have this huge tension between you know, competing ideas of what's true and, what, and, and what's not true. And so how do you get to the true heart, the true stomach, the, 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 the intestines of, 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 of the actually true? Sometimes you have to manipulate it just a little bit. Um, and one of the other reasons why, the, why, why the, the, the book is a novel is, you know, there's this Jewish man uh, driving from Jerusalem to a monastery, a Christian monastery in Beit Jala. There's a Muslim man driving away from a monastery in Beit Jala. The monastery exists. It's there. It's in that town. The, the two men have been in that town, like, you know, at least 100 days a year of, 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 of every year. They have never been to the monastery. I put them together in the monastery because the monastery was the natural place for them to tell this story. So, so all of these things make it into a novel, but it's really, I don't care whether it's novel or nonfiction. I, I hope, I can't say, it's not up to me, but they have said that it is true. Um, yeah. And that was the most important thing. I um, and I know you might want to re read uh, something in a couple minutes here, but I, I wanted to ask you. You know, you've another really powerful scene to me, right? Given the world I used to inhabit, is uh, you know, Bassam goes up to uh, North, you know, these peace conferences in North in Belfast, and 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 I know how deeply you've thought about and examined the Northern Ireland peace process and written about it, obviously, and written about George Mitchell, who's a, a friend in common that we have, um, and, and he's this kind of you know, he's looking at this world and there are panel discussions with, you know, topics around conflict resolution. And, and he's this man with a very visceral experience. And I've been at those conferences, you know, and actually I remember when I got out of government, one of the first things I did is I went with Jonathan Powell, who helped negotiate the, the Northern Ireland peace deal uh, from the British end. And we went to try to train people in Myanmar on how to do a peace process. And I remember thinking, can you really take lessons from one I see why people do it, but given how much these conflicts are about distinct identity-based issues, you know, is it portable to say, what can we learn from Northern Ireland? And if you just apply that in the Middle East, maybe you'll get somewhere. And, and I'm curious, what did, clearly you connect the two things, right? Um, uh, there's this interconnection between the experience of the Northern Ireland uh, conflict. And by the way, I didn't even know the extent to which the Republicans that identify with the Palestinians and the uh, unionists with the Israelis, and I, I learned that. And like I said, you learn all these things in the book. When you were done writing this, did you feel like there's something that you understood about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because of how much you thought about the Northern Ireland conflict? Did you think that there were that that there was a relevant shared experience of people who've been in an identity-based conflict, or do you think that that sometimes can be overstated? Um, both. Uh... Yes and no, and and one of the things I want to talk about a little bit tonight is like it, it is like the, the the idea of I don't know, uh, I am confused, um, and um, embracing the I don't know it uh, of, of of the world. Um, increasingly, I feel that we 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 we're, we're afraid to say I don't know, um, and the best people that you meet in these peace processes are the ones who say, guess what, I'm confused. George Mitchell goes in and says, I want to listen. I'm gonna sit on my rear end and they can call me iron pants because I can sit in this chair for as long as it can be, but I am going to listen. And fundamentally, you know, he was saying, I need to know, I want to know you. I, 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 I'm not interested in telling you how to feel. I'm not interested in telling you how to be. You know, we're living in a world where we've been told continually by artists, by corporations, by politicians, you know, how it is that you should feel, by university professors, this is how you should feel. But the best people 
The very best people are the ones who say, Jesus Christ, I'm so freaking confused. Uh, you know, um, I, 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 I really don't know. Let's try and unpack this. And Bassam and Rami are those people who say, I kind of want to know you because I don't know you. And if I don't know you, then I'm in serious trouble. So if you go to Myanmar, if you go to Israel, if you go to Palestine, if you go to Mali, if you go to Belfast, the people that you meet, the ones who are my heroes, you know, the, along with the teachers and the and the women's coalition and all these sort of things, are the ones who are prepared to say, "Oh, geez, I, I you know, uh, you know," and um, to go in humbly. I and mean, this is the thing about like like the difference between cultural appropriation and what I call cultural celebration. Uh, cultural appropriation is so real. It, it, it's like God bless those university professors who are talking about it right now because they, we've been going in for years and years and pushing things down and, and, and condescending and patronizing and grabbing things and saying, oh, you know, and, and, and doing all these things. But, but if you go in in a different way, like say Mitchell went into Northern Ireland, like you want the great peace people to go in and say, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stupid here. Um, I'm going to bow my head in front of all of this uh, and, and say that I need to become um, a deeper person because you, uh, Ben, or you, whoever it happens to be, have a greater knowledge and I'm going to listen to you. And then it becomes about cultural celebration. Um, I go back to my culture and reinvigorate my culture and make it bigger because I have acknowledged my ignorance. Um, and, 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 and I'm really scared that, that we're not acknowledging our ignorance uh, in, in, enough. Um, and um, you know, I think about it, like I think the Obama years, which you shaped, were, 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 were full of all this sort of wonderful doubt. Yeah. It was contradictory. It was Whitman-esque. Do I contradict myself? They're very well, then I contradict myself. But now we're living in an era where you can't contradict yourself or is that, or is that fair or unfair? Yeah, no. And it, I mean, it actually, there's something else that to it that, that is connected, I think, to the not knowing that, uh, and, and, you know, the, um, the very short anecdote I tell is that I remember when we went to, to, to Israel with Obama, one of the times um, we went to Ramallah and met with a group of Palestinian young people who had the most wrenching stories, of occupation you could have. And, and they've been selected for that reason. You know, so they, they, you know, they've been imprisoned. Uh, the soldiers had occupied their homes. They lived on the wrong side of a barrier so they couldn't see their family. Horrifying stories, but just fundamentally good and decent uh, seeming normal kids, right? Um, a young girl who was on the, the Palestinian soccer team but couldn't travel to Brazil to meet Pele because she has a Gaza passport. I mean, on and on. And then we had to fly in a helicopter and then Obama had to give a speech to a few thousand Israelis. Um, and I remember he ad-libbed, he went off the, you know, the script, the teleprompter for a long time in the middle of the speech, just going on about, if you could just go sit down with these kids, like we could solve this conflict, you know, because I believe that you could see your own kids in them, you know? Um, and that was the thing about uh, Obama that, that he would, it was the doubt, but also the like, because you have doubt, you have to walk around in somebody else's shoes and see the world from through their eyes. And I was really struck in the middle of the book. So the book kind of builds to the two of them in the first person kind of sharing the core of their experience at the center of your book. And what I was struck by is, because it, it'll come back to what we're talking about, uh, I'm just going to read the two sentences that start this. You know, my, my name is Rami Elhanan. I'm the father of Smidar. I'm a 67-year-old graphic designer, an Israeli, a Jew, a seventh generation Jerusalem, Jerusalemite. Um, and that's kind of how he introduced himself. And then you have, my name is Bassam Aramin. I'm the father of Abir. I'm a Palestinian, a Muslim, an Arab. And what's interesting to me is that in their identities, as they, they list their own identities, right. and they both start with being the, the father of these daughters before they go into Israeli, Jew, Palestinian, right. Arab. And, and this question of identity obviously is, is core to why this conflict has not been resolved, that people cannot reconcile their identities. They see their identities in conflict. And what you've done here is that's so interesting is the way that these two people can do that is that they can start with the identity of being fathers, you know, um, in that shared experience. And I'm just wondering, I felt like you guided us through these questions of identity. And we're living in a time now where 
in a strange way, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, despite a lot of news about it, uh, annexation looming on the horizon, is faded from view in part because that that kind of identity politics is is weird is gone global. You know, nationalism is on the rise. Uh, tragically, in our own country, we've seen in the last 48 hours a way in which our own identity politics um, can be weaponized um, against individuals and lead to their deaths in the same way that that this book describes. And, and I'm wondering, how do you how do you so much of your work deals in this space? I mean, how, how, what can we learn from these two men and from what you found about the Israeli-Palestinian issue, what can we learn from that about identity and, and trying to find common ground and trying to find common experience and, and having not just doubt, but enough empathy and curiosity about people of other identities that we can have a shared kind of experience? Uh, a beautiful question. I, and I wish we could, we could bring back uh, Edward Said and he would sit between us on both of our shoulders and he would talk about the, the, the necessity um, that, 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 that we understand that we are not just one thing. We are so much more than one thing. We're messy, Ben. I mean, uh, like we're so freaking messy and, and, and we're so afraid to say, um, you know, I am a messy person. Um, because somehow it, it, it you know it won't protect your tax dollars and it won't protect this sort of like which which is baloney um you know really if 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 we can get back to uh you know artists talking about the absolute messiness of human experience and then somehow forcing our politicians when we hit the reset button on all this stuff to 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 say you know i am not as stupid as my political party seems to want me to be uh, and I and I don't care how red you are. I don't care how blue you are. You know, I don't care, care how Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, I am just, you know, I am like within this. I, I don't define me uh, by 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 these principles. Define me by being a father. Define me by being a human. Define me by looking you in the eye somehow as we are looking each other in the eye um, across the internet. And, and who, who's going to be the person who's going to do this? This is really exciting and, and, and really terrifying right now. But, you know, is it going to be, is it going to be like an army of Greta's? doesn't have to be a 15 year old it could be a 50 year old it could be a 75 year old but 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 there are people out there who have uh, who, who, who have this the solution somehow that like Greta was so good I mean I love Greta yeah I mean I, I would I would love to have Greta go to uh, Israel and and, and, and Palestine. Uh, and to go through checkpoint 300 between Jus Jerusalem and Bethlehem and walk through checkpoint 300 and just to see what she says afterwards and what she would say to all the like 15 year olds around the world. Uh, we should not be walking through checkpoints. Um, and um, if we can somehow acknowledge uh, that that human experience is messy and, 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 and scuffed up, um, I'm pretty, I'm, I, 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 I'm pretty optimistic. I don't know about you. I'm pretty optimistic about this um, this new generation, the like 15 yeah. to 25 year olds. I have three of them myself, but um, they're yeah. pretty engaged. Yeah, yeah. I see that everywhere I go. I mean, I, it, it's it's actually striking, and and they figured out, you know, how much the older people screwed it up. You know. Um, I, well, I wanted to give you. I don't know, Colm, if you want to read anything. For, uh, um, uh, and, I, and I should say, there's this kind of apex in the middle, right? Um, of a thousand mm -hmm. one, uh, you build up to it, and then you, uh, you know, you have a second half that kind of closes the loop. But um, do you want to read anything? Or in, in uh, yeah, if I, if I can, and thank you for giving me the chance to do it, I, I will read the section right in the middle, um, one thousand and one, um, which. Um, basically gives away the whole plot of the novel. <laughs> um, and it's one sentence. Um, and I want to, to, to say that I'm, I'm, thank, I'm thankful to my son, John Michael, who helped me work on this sentence for a long, long time and listened to me speak it. Uh, he was 17, 18 years old when I first started this novel. He's now 21. Um, and here it is, that this is basically, it's just two minutes, folks, so uh, don't go away. Um, a thousand and one. 
Once upon a time and not so long ago and not so far away, Rami El Hanan, an Israeli, a Jew, a graphic artist, husband of Nurit, father of Alik and Guy and Yigal, father too of the late Smadar, traveled on his motorbike from the suburbs of Jerusalem to the Crimson Monastery in the mainly Christian town of Beit Jala near Bethlehem in the Judean hills to meet with Bassam Aramin, a Palestinian, a Muslim, a former prisoner, an activist born near Hebron, husband of Salwa, father of Arab and Arin and Muhammad and Ahmed and Iba. Father, too, of the late Abir, 10 years old, shot dead by an unnamed Israeli border guard in East Jerusalem almost a decade after Rami's daughter, Smadar, two weeks away from 14, was killed in the western part of the city by three Palestinian suicide bombers, Bashar Sawala, Youssef Shuli, and Tawfiq Yassin from the village of Asaria al-Shamalia near Nablus in the West Bank a place of intrigue to the listeners gathered in the red brick monastery perched on the hillside in the mountains of the beloved by the terrace vineyard in the shadow of the wall, having come from as far apart as Belfast and Kyushu, Paris and North Carolina, Santiago and Brooklyn, Copenhagen and Terezin, on an ordinary day at the end of October, foggy, tinged with cold, to listen to the stories of Bassam and Rami and to find within their stories another story, a song of songs, discovering themselves, you and me, in the stone tiled chapel where we sit for hours, eager, hopeless, buoyed, confused, cynical, complicit, silent, our memories imploding, our synapses skipping in the gathering dark, remembering while listening all of those stories that are yet to be told. Well, it's a it's one hell of a sentence, Colin. Um, I, uh, I I I did want to just you know, and we have a bunch of questions that I'll get to if you you know. I see nine on the ask a question, so I'll start to go through those. But who who is speaking? Who is the um, uh, is that your voice? I mean, how do you think about who's guiding us through this journey? This was a miracle of the book for me, man. It, it, it's like I was like like two years into it, and and and, and honestly, I'm not going to curse, but what the f, uh, you know. Like, who is the narrator of this book? I'm, I'm going, is it like, you know, me? Is it some sort of like, like omniscient? I don't like that. It's really, they're, they're, um, and then um, in writing this section, I realized, well, there's like, like there's, there, there's nine or 10 people in the monastery listening to the story, but really the narrator of the book is you. The narrator of the book is the reader. Now, I thought that was revolutionary when, when, when I came upon it. But then I realized that maybe the narrator of every single book is the reader. Um, but in explicitly in this book, um, I think possibly for the first time that I know of, that, 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 that I'm sure there are other cases, uh, many, many more. Uh, but explicitly in this book, I make the, the reader into the narrator because she chooses uh, the way to... to to read it and she chooses the stresses and she chooses some of the music of it um and 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 so that to me with that day because i was thinking okay i'm gonna make her into some welsh uh you know you read your mind like when you when, when you sit down to write do you do you do you think of who your reader is or oh yeah 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 i mean um and and, and the ultimate reader like uh, is myself 10 years down the line making sure that I'm not going to embarrass myself. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, that's the, that's the thing. Like, you know, are, are, are you going to be embarrassed by this 10 years from now? That, 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 that's one of the questions. And, and then, you know, I have lots of, uh, I have lots of readers uh, who, 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 you know, friends who, who, who look at this stuff. That's the other thing, man, showing this to Israelis and then Palestinians um, and they, they would say, well, that's correct, and then the, the other person would say that's completely incorrect. <laughs> you know, the exact same, the yeah. exact same thing. And uh, trying and trying to balance. Well, no, no, not balance, because this is really important. This is not a balanced book. Yeah, yeah. Even well, though it looks like it's a balanced book, it's not a balanced book. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, well, I want to. I, I want to get to uh, some of these questions here. There's one that I, I, it's good to start with, given that this is the beginning of the Dublin Voices series. Which is a you and I will both agree with the premise of this question from uh, E. W. Patterson. Ireland has produced so many extraordinary writers. How and why? <laughs> huh. Uh, 
I mean, it's something that I've thought about, you know, and, and, and we've all thought about for a long, long time. I mean, we had our language taken from us. We had our land taken from us. We had all sorts of things. And, and, and um, you know, to be in opposition to something is some is something that all, often gives it um, energy. Uh, the reverence for the storyteller, uh, the reverence for the idea of the story, uh, the allowance um, of even, and, 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 and I think, um, you know, I know there's some some people from the diplomatic corps on on listening here right now. Ireland's footprint in the world um, has been been large because we've been brave about getting out there in the world. We punch way above our weight, um, and finally, and you know, amongst a, a welter of other possible answers, I would say, man, the teachers. Um, and if I have any heroes of any, like, like, like you know, and, 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 you know, I go into New York and, and seven o'clock these nights, you know, people are hanging out the windows, banging the saucepans for those heroes who were down in the hospitals and doing all the first responder work and everything. Great. But the, but the real enduring heroes of this country, um, it seems to me, or of any place, happens to be the teachers who are paid a shitty amount of money and, 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 and take the democracy and they hold the essence of democracy in the palms of, of, of their hands, and we need to we need to, to to treat them better. The Irish education system, from the 1950s on, uh, became a powerhouse of equanimity, um, and 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 that was incredibly important um, in uh, the way literature and music and all sorts of things developed. Yeah. Um, a lot more to say about that, but I want to get to a couple more of these questions. Um, I mean, one, you mentioned that you shared this with Rami Bassam. Uh, Susan Goldman wants to know whether you passed the book by them before publication. Did you give them a chance to, to request any changes? And if so, how did that play out? Yeah, I did. I gave it to them um, uh, and went across and, and, and I read them sections. And, and, and they were so generous. They were so kind. And they, they, you know, they, 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 and I think they didn't know what the book was what was going it was difficult and they're very busy men and they're involved with the parents circle and did all these things um and uh, but 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 i gave it to them in in in, in lots of different incarnations uh, all the way along and um and and i even read a, a section one night to basam and um uh, you know I, I i described how he married the girl uh, of his you know he married his wife 30 33 days after meeting her and after having gone and talked for for two hours and and he said to me that's perfect that's perfect but i met her 30 no i said 34 days he said yeah. 33 days <laughs> yeah. um well i you know there are such rich characters which leads to another question here um and actually i i had a similar thought because i noticed um George Mitchell appears in this book. Uh, he's obviously been so, it was interesting to me because I know George Mitchell, uh, like you do. And I also know him from Transatlantic and then he's a character in this book. Uh, so it's interesting to see him cycle through these, these stories. William McKenna asks here, uh, I've read so many of your books. Uh, as a reader, I sometimes wish that I could explore more of my favorite character after the book is done. Have you ever been tempted to revisit a character of yours? And, and Mitchell, obviously you do in this context, but you know, Rami and Basham are rich characters. Could they show up in a future book? Or do you, as your as your body of work grows, you're, you're still a very young man, Colm, of course. Um, do you sometimes think that you've created this uh -huh. new character that you want to, you know, pull, you can you can pull them back into future works? Um, or do you feel like characters exist for you in, in the context of one of one book, of one novel? It's a great question. And it's a, and it's a provocative idea. Um, I will say this. That I wrote a book called Let 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 the Great World Spin, and um, in that book, there's a, a 38 year old African American hooker who you know operates under the the, the ma major Deegan. It would be very difficult for me to write that character now, and this is only 10 years ago, uh, because of some of the political debates that are that, that are going on. And I understand this; I understand it very well, and I'm very 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 sensitive to it. Um, but um, you know, I would like. In, in, in certain ways uh, to revisit her because she was saucy and sassy and funny. And um, and then um, also Claire, there's another woman, Claire, who lives on the Upper um, East Side in, 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 in um, Let the Great World Spin. She's another character whom I want to, to try and revisit. Um, but ultimately there's so many of them um, that 
Like, uh, I, it keeps sort of expand, expanding outwards, and I kind of want to meet my, 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 my next character too. So that's um, you know, um, you know, and 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 the world is full of people that we haven't yet met, uh, and and that sounds weird, but 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 I'm really interested in the six and a half billion people that I haven't yet met. Yeah, yeah, no, that, um, yeah, there's a lot of people out there. I, I, um, uh. Actually, I was going to ask you another question that then sets up a, another question I'll come back to here. But I, I was just thinking about the Irish question in my mind, the writer question, and it, it did strike me, too, that there's this kind of underdog. Uh, this underdogs sometimes make good writers um, uh, and right. uh, people who need to make their own identity because they're trying to be suffocated, in this case, by the British. Um, but what it made me think of um, is... One of the things that's so, so distinct about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that they're both groups, identities that have historically been, you know, in some way underdogs or marginalized. I, what's so peculiar, right, is that the Jewish people have suffered uh, as much as anybody in history, and, and yet now they seem to find, you know, they find themselves the, the stronger party, obviously. Um, but as, as someone who's Irish, did you... Is there something about the mindset of Israelis and Palestinians, Jews and Palestinians, that you felt like you could get into the sense of, of a people that that have felt historically wronged um, uh, at the mercy of larger powers and larger forces? Um, was that familiar to you? It was super familiar. I mean, okay, I I used to go on the bus up through the checkpoints in Armagh with my mom, who's from Derry. I'm from Dublin, but 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 you know we did the checkpoints, did the whole thing, um, and 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 you know when I went over there, the identification of the 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 the, the Palestinians in particular uh, with 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 the Irish was really 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 um, striking, but also um, the. the the, the the Jewish parallels that were going on, you know, like like Chaim Herzog was born, the first president of, of Israel was born in Belfast. There were there, there, there were connections there, connections with the land, all of these things. And and um, here's the deal, man. Like I, what I what really want to talk about is like how friendly the goddamn people were. Like like I, you know, when I go into to uh, Beit Jala, people say, you know, come to our house, you know, come 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 enjoy. And 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 the same thing happens in like you know Tel Aviv, you know, why don't you come see this? Um, and it's heartbreaking to me to you know to 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 know that these people who are four miles apart are not actually meeting, and and yet they're so. Ex if I took all the creative capital that I met in 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 Israel and Palestine, it would be top of the Forbes list. It would be richest of of the Forbes list of anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And and those young Palestinians who got their minds are like going in like, uh, but they don't get acknowledged because they're so they're they're monolithic. They are you know the terrorist and the the the, the Israeli is you know this colonizer whatever it happens to be in yeah. in certain people's imagination and it goes back to messiness yeah you know if we can allow their messiness you know and the peace plan or whatever you know like like it's not so like uh, maybe some something something different would happen yeah i had the same experience in cuba you know uh, the most ingen the, the ingenuity of those people I mean, they, they don't have classic cars from the 50s running because they want to. <laughs> they, they have no choice. But they, 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 the ingenuity and friendliness of people who have every reason to not feel that way. It was what, do you, what, do you miss, what do you miss about like your, your, your trips to Israel and Palestine? The people. I mean, what you just said, it, what was so infuriating, you know, is that you would meet particularly younger people and the friendliest people. They want to share their, your, their stories with you. Uh, they they've all been touched by this this conflict in, in some way, um, but they're they're trapped. You know, they they they're they're trapped by the indecision or decisions of their leaders. Um, but I mi I mean I miss the food too. Frankly, <laughs> the food's really good over there. Yeah. But, but it is it is because it's it's people with an experience that is totally unique. You know, it's you know you, you can go someplace and you're going to learn something about be, hum human beings that you couldn't learn anywhere else other than there. You know. Um, and the tension there, yeah. it's like, it, it's kind of electric because, you know, you've got the meeting point of three religions, you've got the meeting point of three continents, you know, you've got all these things that are going there. 
and everyone goes to Jerusalem in some form or, 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 or other some, at, at some stage in their lives. But I will never forget being in a smoothie shop right, in Jerusalem and asking this guy, did he, he know where, what they call the Arab bus was because I wanted to go to Bethlehem. And he said, oh, it's up there, man. He said, I really want to go to Bethlehem. I said, come on, let's go to Bethlehem. He said, I can't go to Bethlehem. Well, he could go to Bethlehem because there's parts of Bethlehem which are in you know, area A, B, C. It gets complicated. But he ended up crying, saying, I want to go there. I want to experience it. And like, I, want to, I really want to have a look. This guy's 25, 26 years old. And um, he sort of unable, paralyzed by politics, uh, when he could really easily go and um, by the way, Bethlehem is is, is a really cool, like yeah. sort of explosively electric sort of city. Well, I well I remember like the the this, the the insanity of the conflict would come out, and we, we were when we went to Bethlehem, uh, Obama went in a motorcade, and I remember some crazy discussion I had to get in about you know motorcades are huge, and they're they're people from the countries you're visiting, you know, who are playing some role, you know, they're, they're driving the, you know, the vans or something, but you couldn't have Israeli drivers in some places or Palestinian drivers in others. And so we were swapping out the drivers and all this, nothing that you would experience anywhere else in the world over just like a 15 minute drive, you know, yeah. and then you get in the church of the Holy Sepulchre, right. And then the Christian sects, you know, this Orthodox sect has this part of the church and then you're handed off from one patriarch to the next. So it's not just the, the Palestinians and Israelis. There's something about that land and, and the importance of that land to so many people that right. makes people literally crazy. Um, but I do think that this question from Rob grows right out of this conversation. He says, um, I perhaps too regularly need to share this quote of yours. Um, quote, I'm not interested in blind optimism. I'm interested, but I'm very interested in optimism that is hard won it takes on darkness and then says, this is not enough, but it takes time, more time than we can sometimes imagine to get there. That's her quote. And Rob says, can you speak about this and radical empathy in the context of our current political and cultural climate? So, I mean, it's another version of essentially, um, you know, we're, we're surrounded by the insanity of what we were just talking about. Uh, people are decent, mostly. <laughs> um, but circumstances are driving away from the hard one optimism. Um, how do you react to that quote of yours uh, and its relevance? Well, 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 thank you to Rob for, 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 for bringing it up. First of all, check out Narrative 4, uh, narrative4.com and what we're doing at Narrative 4 with radical empathy. We're getting people to step into one of those shoes, kids from, for example, the Bronx and uh, you know Kentucky, getting to meet one another and, 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 and learning one another's stories. But here's the deal. Um, uh, I think the cynics, the cynics are sentimental. I mean, um, and that will drive them apoplectic to say that because cynics are supposedly muscular and hard. They know the deep, hard truth. No, they bore the hell out of me. They, they, they're so soft. They sit in the corner. They're not prepared to get out of the corner. They, they, they travel in the cloud of their own sentiment, which is like, like an absolute definition of sentimentality. The optimist has to be as equally cynical uh, as that person who's sitting in the corner and then to say, so what? Let's go out and do something about it. So that's what I, what, what, what I mean when I think, um, you know, and there's this Israeli word that I, that, that, that I heard a couple of times, a, a pez optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Which, and, you know, it, it's an inter it, it's an interesting term, you know, to to be you know a, a, a pessimist and an optimist at the same time. Um, pessimist first, optimist second. Pes optimist. Um, uh, but 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 hold on to that one. Develop that one. The cynics are sentimental. The cynics are soft. The optimists are the ones who got who have got the, like the the, the 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 sort of you know hard fought uh, you know. And, and 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 guess what? You know, all of this stuff is is, is difficult. But I think the optimists are, are are much more muscular than 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 the cynics happen to be. Well, I remember you know Obama used to uh, when he'd get criticized sometimes for you know um, not being too optimistic or you know what you know don't you? I mean, just to talk about the issues that have been the news, you know um, the you know the futility of racial progress. Um, you know, he, he would say sometimes to me, you know, like, hey, I know better than anybody. 
you know, um, I'm not naive. I know better than anybody uh, the structural racism in this country. Um, or not better than anybody, but as well as, you know, I feel my bones, given my, my lived experience of being black. But my my role is to be an optimist. You know, anybody can just say, yeah, this is horrible. You know, and, and it, it was hard one, you know, that was the, the, in his mind, it was the harder path to be optimistic. Um, and uh, imagine the Selma speech being done today. Yeah. Can you imagine? I, mean, I think we should all go back in and like, 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 like go into the archives and bring out that 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 speech that you guys did uh, at, at at that stage and the way he delivered it and and the power with which he delivered it. And listen, in your book, um, you 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 know you the the which is a fantastic book, uh, you know, and 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 and, and, and a powerful, powerful book and an important book. But uh, you know, in the first opening salvo. You talk about like um, Obama saying, "Turn around to you and being in the in, in the beast, the bulletproof um, uh, limousine," and saying, "Maybe I got here too early." Uh, how, how how do you feel about that? Did you, like was he too early, or will history say he was just a, a, a venture at the right time? And this right now is the last kick of a dying horse. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, the the very. The practical point he was making is that the demographics of the country are evolving in such a way that 15 or 20 years from now, just as a matter of politics, um, it'd be basically impossible for someone like Trump to get elected with their coalition. Um, and that Obama was early, um, you know, late enough to get elected as an African-American president, but early enough that there could be this kind of virulent backlash to everything he did. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think if you look at, so Selma's in, instructive, right? So Selma, for people, you know, sh check out the speech, but basically he gives a speech uh, and about the meaning of Selma. And what he does is he kind of, he gives the progressive view of American history. And my favorite part of that speech is he validates, and I remember him saying to Cody Keenan and I, like, get me your list of your favorite heroes. You know, let's all make, and, and it, but this time it's, it's not just going to be the founding fathers. It's going to be Jackie Robinson. You know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be everybody, you know, people from Seneca Falls, people, you know, it's going to be the, the workers who organize. It's going to be, you know, and, and, and if you, the most joyful part of that speech is his kind of recitation of, uh, 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 of all the forgotten heroes, some famous, some not famous, who were underdogs, but made America what it is, you know, built our culture and built our social movements, built our political progress. It'd be very emotional to read right now, obviously. Um, and um, to me, I still believe that that is the, the direction of American history, that, that people ask me all the time about legacy, that, that we always have people who come on early and there's always a backlash to them, but they help reshape what is possible. And it's right. always later generations that fulfill what they were trying to do. That's always been... The, the arc of progressive change in America. Um, and, yeah, no, and so to me, like, uh, you know, when people ask me about legacy, I said, legacy, ask me in 25 years. And if in 25 years, America looks a lot more like Barack Obama's politics uh, than Donald Trump's, like, then yet he will have been early, but he will have been at the front edge of where America was going, you know? Um, and unfortunately, there's never a step forward without a step back in our in the story of our country. And our We've always had two stories, a progressive story and, and a reactionary story. I would like to think, Colm, you know, that um, in the, if the Selma speech existed in some future date for uh, Israel and Palestine, um, that, uh, that, that your characters, Rami and Bassam, would be in the yeah. of heroes. You know, those are exactly the people that Obama was trying to lift up and validate in that Selma speech, you know, that, that when it looked impossible, um, there were still people like this, you know, yeah. and when they're early in, 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 in the places where they come from. Um, right. And at least show, because you're right, it's so easy to be cynic. Oh, there's no, there'll never be peace. And, um, and that may be true, actually, in this case, it's, it's a really hard problem. But, but man, that's just an, cynicism is an excuse, you know. Uh, the, the, the politicians want you to be apathetic and think that nothing can change. And, and these men, uh, because of their daughters believe that, that it, it not only should, but it must. Right. Um, I mean, that, that to me, I mean, how do you take, what optimism do you take from 
from writing this book? I mean, how do you enter into writing a book about, you know, this oh, kind of It's a book, like weirdly, against all, in the face of all available evidence, it's a book about hope. Um, and, um, you know, in, 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 in the end, uh, you know, R Rami and Bassam both talk about like, you know, uh, the weird fact that there's now a, a German embassy in Tel Aviv and there's a Israeli embassy in um, Berlin. And, you know, how could that have happened? And it's, it, it's, it's, it's down to us believing that we have to tell the story over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, the miracle of these men is that they, this is what they do. Good God. Like the, the day I met them, they blew my world wide open. Um, I didn't realize they'd already told the story three times that day. I thought I was hearing it for the first time. And this is our job. And it's the job of all those kids that are out there and all those people who are listening. So, um, um, you know, uh, ultimately, I hope this is a book about uh, uh, about hope. And, and, and it's been, you know, um, you know, uh, such a pleasure to to to. To, to talk about it here um, this evening, um, especially with you, because um, we got to bring some hope to where we happen to be right now too. This is going to be a tough, tough time for 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 for, for our country and 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 who and where we happen to be. But um, it's people like yourself and and bring out Obama. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be out. He'll be out. I have to call me. You really, you know, uh, you, you remind us that that you know. Instead of turning to, to Twitter, we, we need to turn to books uh, to find truth, optimism, and hope. And, and, and I love I loved this book feeling hopeful um, just because whenever you can see that kind of common humanity, um, uh, never mind all the other lessons that you embed in the book, uh, you leave feeling empowered just through that recognition of common humanity. And I want to, uh, so everybody should check out this book as well as if you haven't read all of Tom's other books. And, and uh, it's truly extraordinary. It's a singular book. I mean, you'll never read a, another book like this book. Um, and, and I think it you know, can really it will change how you think about not just this conflict, but a lot of things. And I should add, everybody should support Politics and Prose, uh, one of the truly great bookstores out there. So thank, thanks. Oh. Yeah, thanks for guys. <laughs> Ben you just did my work for me, so thank you very much. Um, we also have Ben's book for sale, um, so please support both authors tonight. Um, without that support and without the book sales, we really can't keep putting on programs like this. So it's pretty necessary right now. Um, and thank you especially for joining us tonight um, for our first Dublin Voices event. And as I said, we're hosting Sinead Gleason on June 7th with Leslie Jameson um, at 3 p.m., which should be another fascinating conversation. Sinead's amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was an honor to listen to you both. Um, thank you all. Stay well and stay well read. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thanks, Tom. Hey, Ben, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was awesome. I really thank loved you. it.